This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. My name is Linda Farthing. I, I wanted to uh, ask Caroline whether or not there had been uh, any differences between uh, closures and how closures were carried out between st- uh, places that had stain owned mining companies and the private ones. Sorry, I'm dreadful hard hearing, that's why I'm, I'm just checking the question. So it's the difference between state-owned and, um, and private. And privately owned. Um, I'm a bit of a cynic here because I actually have been saying for a while I don't think we have any example anywhere of good practice in mind closure across all the spectrum. We still don't know how to close a mine. Um, and so we look at the state and the private sector, and I suppose if I think of the huge state investment in East Germany, around Sudbury in Canada, in Poland, in Russia, they have deep pockets and they have had to go in even if it was took quite a long time uh, to try and regenerate those big regions that were all mining regions. So that's what comes to mind on the state side. The private sector, until 30 years ago, closed the door, locked the key, and walked away. Um, so. Yeah, I, I was asking more, like in some parts of the world, there are. Some like in Bolivia and in Peru, there are state mining companies, right, that are controlled by the state. So I was asking whether there's really a difference between the way that state-owned companies or state-owned mining operations have functioned and private. I think that their um, objectives will be different. So the state will be much more interested in the socioeconomic impact. Uh, I'm not that familiar with state-owned in, in Bolivia. But I know in um, Africa, for example, the environmental rehabilitation is not as immediate a priority as making sure that people have food to eat and can educate their kids. So in some ways, the state's um, objectives may be slightly different. However, it is the state who sets the regulation that imposes what the company has to do when it pulls out. And I think you will find on most of the legend, on most of the books, it's all about financial provisioning for environmental cleanup and vegetation rehabilitation of the land, rather than looking at there are no funds set aside. There's no financial provisioning for what happens to people after mining. And until we start to address that seriously, private companies. Well, not. They, they, you know, they think that if they've had their sustainable development fund and they've done that work while they're there, they're not necessarily putting the funds in for afterwards. And that's where there's a link between what Rosemary was talking about and what I'm saying about who the lead agents are at different stages of the cycle. Um, but I would have thought that state <coughs> objectives are different to private company objectives because the state's still there when the mine closes. And what incentives do states and private companies actually have to give it down for any of this? Because um, governments are inherently short term and we ask them in democracy to to be more short term, to not think about having a long tenure of dictatorship or something like that. So their thoughts are about how they maintain their power for that short block of time they can expect to do so. So to ask them to look 
30, 40, 50 years in the future, as I've asked you to use what's going to happen in 50 years' time to the world. And for a private company, all they care about, and all that they are expected to care about, is what they can return to their shareholders on a year by year basis. So neither of them have inherently a long term uh, view, and perhaps we shouldn't expect them to, perhaps we'd like them to. So, what is the incentive for either of those actors to think in this way? I'm going to take two, a couple more questions, but I'll just quickly um, try and go back to the question was, how do you accept this? I think the question and this one goes to me for, uh, I was wondering how do you build institutional capacity as you grow? Um, should it be top down from the central government? I've done some research on, on the mining industries, I've actually given workshops to subnational governments on developing uh, management capacities, but they've been pretty uh, failed. So I was wondering what are your thoughts on how to build institutionality as you grow economically, which seems to be like the key the key challenge. One more question. Incentives is why I was keen to point out that the long, what is the long term, is very different for different individuals. But also, the, um, and that is not um, simply a matter of a, a national government, perhaps looking at an entire country with many mining possibilities. It's also about the fact that the business is in part for five years, and that the time horizon for politicians or the time they're likely to be in government. So it's very reasonable, isn't it? Um, and then, um, you know, as you go, as you run the whole gamut, the, 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 the incentives vary um, until you get down to the very local level where people have got to survive, basically. That's one of the correct incentive to live in a very short fashion possible. So if, if the incentives issue is a hugely important one, yeah. Um, but all I can say is that you um, you do get um, the governments um, that feel empowered and need to, because of their political bases, to take a long-term view. And um, actually, I don't know what um, um, Ilar is going to say about this because she's a Bolivian expert and knows it much better than I. But I mean, in the Morales government in Bolivia, I think you've got a government which um, in has identified its short-run political survival interests as the interests of behaving much more responsibly in relation to mining for the long run. So sometimes it can work out, and it's politics that enables that, the political structures. Um, so the, the other thing I, I certainly note, um, if we look at companies, um, I mean, nobody 20 years ago was talking about corporate social responsibility. Uh, you may be a total cynic when it comes to total uh, corporate social responsibility, but at least everybody should have to talk about it. <laughs> and quite a number of com companies really feel that they actually need to impress their shareholders with considerably more responsible actions than they did 20 years ago. So I think um, it's a matter of the culture of shareholding in that case, um, and the sorts of ways that civil society can put pressure on big companies. And we've made a bit of progress. We've made some progress. Um, so in order to, be, to take it further, you know, we've all got to get out there and put an awful lot more pressure on um, the system to be able to respond. Um, where and how to um, build institutions 
Um, right, okay. A, a very big question, really. Um, I think um, a very interesting area to me is the role you want to give to civil society and in particular the non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and the role you want to, to, to give to, to government to lead this and what, what, you, what you think is helpful. Um, but I think that um, NGOs have a huge role to play in building capacities. And a lot of the work that is needed in institution building is much better not done by the government. Um, I think um, I've seen very bad examples of government-led attempts to um, increase people's autonomy or whatever it is and build their capacities. You know, there's a contradiction there which doesn't allow the work to be very intelligently done, very thoughtfully done. Um, so that I really think it's a huge role to civil society in this. And the ideal situation is when you've got a government that has the common sense to enable civil society to do this work, I think it's then much more satisfactory. But there's not an awful lot of very good examples of it. Um, I think um, when I've seen, I've seen instances of good institution building, not an awful lot, but I've seen some. And um, there's, usually, there's always an element of leadership in, in there. There's the, somebody who really understands what that institution could look like and, um, and shapes it. So in that sense, something comes from up above, but not necessarily in, an, you know, in a top-down way at all. In fact, precisely the work of leadership may be in the ideal example to lead from, from behind in, in a facilitating kind of way. Um, but that can happen within the public sector occasionally. It's much more likely to happen in the NGO sector. Um, but the instance I would think of was um, reform of the tax administration in Peru, which was um, led by a public official, very much backed by the, um, the president, <coughs> and a very unlikely president to back good institution building, namely Fujimori. But he really, really backed this for his own reasons. Um, and it was an extraordinarily successful instance over a period of about eight years, a very good institution, reformed institution that functioned very well. Um, and actually there was a very sad end to the story, which I'll tell you over tea if you don't already know it. But, um, so I think, well, enough of now, so. I think on the, on the institution building, there's something which really we could turn around um, quite easily if we could convince companies that they need to bring some of the funds up front. So if you look at an average um, when the revenues land to the local authority or the, or the government, it's usually 10 years into the project because there's all the capex and all the allowances and all of this, that and the other. And actually, the reason why you have poor governments is because they don't have the funds to train the people and pay them and keep them in those jobs up front when they need to be, to be looking at how the project is developing. So there's something about the, the, the financing legislation that needs to bring funds right up front. And then we have to pay the people who are in the regulator's shoes enough money so that six months after being out of college and having demonstrated that they were any good at all, they are not then recruited by the mining company which is the experience you see in every single place. Once the government gets a good regulator, they're picked up at five times the salary. And so this is also something about the remuneration of the regulator that we have to look at. I agree with Rosemary that the, um, the capacity building and the institutional building done by NGOs is really important. And that takes you to your question about incentives. I think that we're in a very different place than we were even 10 years ago around social license to operate. The incentives for companies like Anglo-American and big companies, Newmont and these sort of people, is that what they're doing in Ghana is visible to the people in Peru, what they're doing in Peru is visible to the people in Alaska, etc. And that is hugely powerful uh, and is only going to get stronger, I think. So companies their incentive to think longer term is about their social license to have new minds in the future. Um, the government long-term incentives, 
just strikes me the question about is democracy compatible with sustainable development? I mean, this is a sustainable development issue, not really a mining sector thing, and we could talk about it all afternoon. But clearly, the political cycle, um, strong civil service with strong legislation is what, you know, mining companies are, from, are always complaining about the political um, short cycles and what they want is stability in legislation. So somehow we have to embed enough legislation uh, to control the mining sector that doesn't move with, with the political cycles. To, to come to your question, Amy, um, good practice elements. Uh, again, I, I think that there are certainly some uh, common themes to where there has been success. But it is the things that make things successful. Uh, strong leadership, strong vision, uh, people who were willing to spend a very long time convincing people who should say no to say yes, engaging unusual suspects, pulling in different sectors, different experts. Mining industry is great at thinking that it's a very specialized, unique um, industry that nobody else really understands. They're out on the frontier and they have very specialized um, skills. But actually there's a whole uh, brownfield regeneration discipline that the mining sector should really look at much better. Um, the, the whole uh, low carbon green economy sector is an ideal marriage for post-mining land use. But the mining industry and the green economy people, they haven't really got together in any significant way. Um, culturally appropriate land uses that are within what has gone on in that area, what's going on around the world. Very simple things, but it is an extraordinary, the diversity of post-mining land use. And that's not surprising when you think of this country and all the old coal fields and um, the different parts of Wales, Scotland and England that have been transformed, not to mention Cornwall, of course. Uh, it, and, and they've reinvented their future, largely driven by the public sector rather than the private sector. But again, leadership, vision, uh, and determination that can come out in all of these examples we've got. There's somebody there who's driving the process, and it's not usually the mine manager. More questions? Yeah. I have a question to uh, Professor Thorpe uh, related to the responses you uh, proposed. Uh, to what extent do these measures, do these responses, uh, can help in um, solving the problem of illegal mining? For example, in the case of Colombia, 80% uh, of the miners are uh, working in the illegal mining. also a question for Rosemary. Rosemary, you, you talked about the Dutch disease early on, and in the morning, Carlos was saying, you know, look at these data, there's clearly evidence of the Dutch disease beginning in Peru. And you even have The Economist saying that a few weeks ago. So I guess the question is, thinking about policy options and alternatives, in the, in the situation that Peru appears to be entering into, with currency appreciation, what, what can it do? Lack of alternatives, lack of control, weakness of institutions. When it comes back, it does come back 
to providing people with alternatives to being illegal minors and control, issues of control. Um, so it's, it, it's absolutely back to the same kind of institutional story that um, we need to look. Um, um, I think it's such an important issue. I mean, it was an amazing battle won in Tampa Grande in Peru, um, and a mining project that did not go ahead. One consequence of that is that that illegal mining is flourishing in that area, and it's not a solution. It's absolutely not a solution. Um, and the answer can only be better controls, better institutions, better provision of alternative ways of Possibly support. I don't know how far. And I can't remember because we have a very good PSD publication on it, um, if, uh, informal mining, which would um, discuss this much better than I can with the advertised thing. But I think um, I don't know how far illegal mining has a future as informal mining. I just don't know the answer to that, but that would be a very important question to go and look at to see how it's far um, If it really doesn't have a future as informal mining, then I just need to be more active. But it would, it's all of this is very context specific and it depends on the kinds of things, how great the dangers of environmental damage and health damage and what have you are. Um, but the, the present situation of any of these things, I think, is one that can't be tolerated in human development terms. And there's so much um, environmental and health abuse that that's what's um, Because I think. Um, Illegal mining um, is so prevalent, it, it largely, as you say, at Tambo Grande, but it's true virtually everywhere. It, it coexists along lar and, uh, alongside large scale mining. And I think there's some responsibility for large scale miners to come in and look at the livelihood options for the small scale miners. And there are examples. I think in, in Venezuela, I'm not sure it's still going on, but certainly when I looked at this 10 years ago, there were models of how to get small-scale miners working on parts of the concession alongside large-scale. And I think we will need to look at that because I think we, the attempts have failed over the last quarter of a century to get people out of artisan mining. And so, I think we have to look at it as a, a part of the system we're working with when the company is helping. I'm touched to see some new evaluation of the exchange rate. I look at start from there. I mean, once you've got into the evaluation, I think it's very, a very difficult to make damage in the situation. So, it's so important to avoid it. I do want to ask Carlos a question. I don't know if it's time for him to answer it because he may know why the stabilization fund was not able to prevent that overvaluation. It's been the case. I'm actually looking at people who are looking at their watches, even though you may not be allowed to answer that. But once you're there, then you know, the, you, someone has got to take a, a, a very nice position to adjust to exchange rates. Right? In, and the, the overvaluation is serious now, I agree, isn't it? But the amazing thing is that it's been developing without much apparent effect, as I understand it, on other non traditional exports, or non traditional exports. It's just seemed to be growing. Well, in Peru, what we have is a stabilization fund to compensate for the ups and downs, but we don't have what you would call a stabilization okay, so fund. It isn't to meant to stop overvaluation. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's a simple and sad explanation. Yeah. So I think this session is very important in unveiling the need to look at the political economy of incentives and see what ways in terms of policy recommendations or policy recommendations, one can reach a situation in which we can combine moments of political vision and leadership with projects of institutional reform that can embed a regulatory capacity by which these long term planning processes and objectives might, might develop with some mechanism of accountability. I'd like to thank two speakers for this.